Today I will be discussing some of the research I have been doing in Zion National Park for my master's degree at Utah State University. My name is Adrian Rodman and my advisor is Dr. Nikki Fry. Um, I'm going to be going over a little bit of the preliminary results from the two field seasons I've spent in Zion, studying the ringtail and some of the management um, suggestions and information that we've gathered in this time to help move forward with uh, preventing these animals from getting into the buildings and also presenting just some basic ecology information that we've collected. So just so we all start on the same page, I'd like to just give a little bit of a background on the ringtail. It is a somewhat Misunder misunderstood animal in that there's there's not a lot of information known and uh, just wanted to make sure we're all on the same playing field. They are present throughout the southwest of the United States. This map is slightly out of date. Their range is a little bit further north than this we believe, but this is a pretty good representation. They are pretty common throughout this entire green area that you can see in the southwest. And uh, for those of you that may not be as familiar with where Zion is, if you can see the cursor here, it's right down there in the southwestern portion of, of Utah. Ringtails are often misnamed. They are sometimes called miners' cats or ringtailed cats or ringtailed raccoons, and all of those are incorrect. The, the official name is simply ringtail. They're not a cat, uh, although they do have cat like movements, and so this has led to these, these other common names of them that are, in fact, scientifically incorrect. They're in a family, the scientific family of the Procyonidae, which is the same family as raccoons, kinkajous, and um, the new animal that was discovered, the Olanguito, as well as Olingos and uh, Kawadis are all in this family as well. Um, mainly they are an American species, so in North America and South America this family is present. Ringtails average one and a half to two and a half pounds, so they're they're pretty small. They physically look about the size of a house cat, but they are um, their body size is much much smaller. Their their large tail and their long fur can sometimes make them appear larger than they they really are. But they're a very small animal. They're strictly nocturnal. These guys may occasionally or rarely be seen at dusk and at dawn, but in general they're only out when it's completely dark. So you are very lucky if you happen to see one outside of that uh, time range. As omnivores, they both raid uh, bird nests and take eggs. They'll take young. Uh, it, since they're nocturnal, they have better access to the birds at night while they're sleeping. They'll take um, reptiles and amphibians if they can find them, but they also eat berries and nectar and all sorts of um, plant material. Uh, as well. So they're, they're pretty opportunistic feeders. They'll eat whatever they can find. They're extremely agile climbers, crawlers, and uh, this leads to them being pretty good thieves. They can get into buildings pretty easily. They can get into campsites and things like that. So that's sort of where we're going from here. But um, knowing this background is, is going to give us a good launching point for everything we're going to talk about. In this area of the country where we're working in southwest Utah, they prefer rocky, shrubby habitat, and this occurs usually near riparian zones. And this is an area where there's present water and some more lush vegetation, and they like big boulder piles. So that's one of the heavy area, that type of habitat is one of the areas we sampled heavily. Previous research on ringtails is very limited. Um, there's, it's becoming more common now, but most of what we know is just purely their basic biology. Uh, what they eat, kind of where they're at. We don't know much about their behavior. We don't know much about their social structure. Uh, that's all forthcoming in the future years, hopefully. But a lot of what we know is, that, is from the fur bearing industry. They are considered a fur bearer in Utah, although that is not true within federally protected lands but um, they are relatively common in the state, so that's good to know. One of the major um, initial studies on ringtails was done in Zion in 1966 and 1967, and this was a home range and habitat use study as well as a comparison between ringtails and gray foxes. Um, so that was used as, this is a, a study that we've compared a lot of our research to from the beginning, um, to see how things have changed in the last 50 years. Um, so that, the, the uh, excuse me, the 
final answer as to has it changed is still coming, but um, the human development side of it absolutely has changed in the last 50 years. The park was being used in the late 60s, but it not to the scale that it is now, and buildings have changed, obviously, and been more developed, and uh, so that's that's one place to compare. The research I've done, this is a map of the park, and for those of you that may not be as familiar, if you work there, obviously you do, um, but this is the main canyon here along the North Fork of the Virgin River. This is the major road that everyone can get into the park, and this is also the main corridor of buildings. And unfortunately, this is also the main corridor of most of the really preferable ringtail habitat that we had access to. So this was our main study area, but these secondary study areas were also considered. Um, obviously there's roads through all of these. This is the east entrance, this is the Kolob Terrace Road, and then the Kolob Canyon um, access road is here. So these were all sampled as well for ringtail presence and conflict with buildings. We initially set up a camera trapping grid throughout the entire park to um, get at the uh, population density and presence of these animals, and I'll get into that in a minute. This is a bit of a background on where we're going with this talk. I also performed a scat and diet study that is under analysis and um, collected scat throughout this, made, this primary uh, study area here for some... Um, to gather some knowledge on what they're eating and how the buildings might be influencing that. We also performed a capture mercury capture sampling period this this past season throughout the park as well as um, this coordinates with the camera trapping to try and get a density estimate to figure out how many ringtails we have. And through this, we've also been working on a footprint analysis, and I'll get into that um, in a little bit, and why that might actually be really helpful to footprint them. I know that seems a little bit uh, off the beaten path. So to begin with our camera trapping, we're set up at 50 sample locations throughout the park. You can see that map on the left. Those are all our locations. And at each site in this photo on the right, you can see a white plastic tunnel that the it's a track plot the animal would walk through that would give us a positive print on the animal so that if the camera did not trigger, which you can see in the, the background on that tree, it's a small brown box, um, if the camera didn't trigger or the or something was there the uh, both methods were combined to increase the effectiveness of each site so if a footprint was present and a camera did not trigger we had both recorded and that will play into the footprint analysis in a minute we ran this survey for 16 months across four seasons and have come up with 413,000 photos. Now this is not 413,000 photos of ringtails. A lot of this is grass moving or smaller animals or deer or any mixture of uh, of animals that have triggered this. So this is going to take some while to piece through but as you can see we have had some success capturing remotely trigger, on remotely trigger cameras, ringtails. This individual is named Yoda. Most of you probably know him as the culprit of the last winter that was causing all the problems. So um, why was this important? This, like I have said before, this gave us a good way of measuring sort of ringtail presence throughout the park and hopefully um, confirming what we know about what habitats they're in and what habitats they're not in. So that's a, a good place to go once we are able to get through all of these photos and tabulate this information. It will be available to the park, but currently this is not ready to really give you some hard numbers on. For the scat portion, this is a ringtail scat, and these were collected both in buildings as well as in the wild. And yes, I am really going to pick apart these scat. Um, I'm actually going to be dissolving them to trying and um, pull out the, the small remnants of the different diet uh, elements that they've consumed and be able to kind of classify which, uh, which types of foods that they're consuming. And this is hopefully going to be able to tell me a little bit more about how the buildings are influencing their diet. They may be using these buildings solely for uh, shelter, although we don't think that's true because they have been stealing food. But I'd like to be able to quantify um, how much of their diet is being influenced by human food. 
So currently we have 108 building scats and 27 wild scats that were collected outside of buildings and far enough away that I, I believe that they are a wild forage scat. However, this could be improved. So if you do see ringtail scat, please con consider um, picking it up and collecting it for me. I have envelopes that you can use if you'd like, as well as gloves. Um, the, the more scats we get, the better um, analysis I'll be able to run, so I do beseech you for your help on that. The capture mark recapture. Animals were captured in a have a heart live trap using a food bait, were anesthetized uh, using a, um, a safe anesthetization uh, drug, and initially we put collars on the animals, which you can see here. It's a radio collar that we would follow the animal with radio telemetry to uh, determine home range. This was abandoned. This method was abandoned shortly after we started because of the the nature of the Zion Canyon. It, it was not really going to work. Um, the signals were were bouncing along the stone canyons. The ringtails were moving too far. So this was ineffective. But every animal that I capture gets these metal ear tags. You can see one here on the outside and one here on the inside of the ear. That these are individually numbered and oops, excuse me individually numbered and will, um, when the animal is recaptured, be able to tell me exactly what animal this is. So based on the number of animals I capture and then in the next trapping event, the number of animals I recapture that are the same, I can use that to build a model to tell me how many animals are in the park. Since 2011, we've only seen 20 distinct individuals. Not all of them had radio colors and not all of them had ear tags, but throughout all the different uh, capture events, we've we've had 20 individuals, and this is much, much lower than we expected. But um, they're all healthy. I've not seen any animals that have any major health concerns. So not only does this tell us uh, how many animals are in this area, but it also tells us kind of the status of the animals. Um, and hopefully this will help me build a better model of where they are, how many there are, and once we know how many there are, we can better determine how many of the animals that are in these areas are also getting into the buildings so we can really measure how big of a problem this is becoming. The footprint portion of this study is is rather new and experimental in terms of wildlife biology. This is not something that has been looked at very much. So these animals, you can they all look relatively similar by their coat patterns. Some animals, bobcats, jaguars, tigers, things like that, you can individually identify them from their spot patterns. But ringtails don't have that. So I was hoping to find a way to completely non-invasively measure these animals without having to capture them and without having to um, immobilize them and work them up. So we have fingerprints and they have footprints that look like this. And so every animal I captured, I individually inked them. I took a, a little criminal database um, inking set from them and I'm going to analyze this to see if we can in fact individually identify them from their footprints. And it's looking very, very positive right now. We have 10 individuals have given me 124 sets, meaning each foot has given me a very distinct, solid print that I can use. So that's, that's really good. And using the charcoal, which was in the uh, track plots that I described with the, the tunnels, um, with the camera traps, they walk through charcoal that's been applied to a metal plate, pick it up on their little feet, and then walk across a piece of contact paper, which is shelf liner paper. And then as they walk across that, it pulls the charcoal from their feet and leaves me a positive print. These charcoal prints have given me 12 print sets that are all valuable, viable to analyze using this method, and these are from nine distinct individuals. So that's very, very positive. So this can hopefully be a method that we continue to employ in the future to be able to individually ID these animals without having to capture them or take DNA or things like that. So to show you kind of what I do is if you overlay two prints like this and you begin flipping back and forth and let your eye wander around and you can kind of see how certain patterns develop. If I can see, put my cursor here. If you watch these these dots, you know, this curve, 
um, maybe this line here. Those all might be a very distinct little patterning, and when we flip back and forth, you can see the curve and the, the distinct line. So you uh, can begin to, to pick out these patterns. So when I would see this print, I might pick out these, these uh, shapes and then overlay this red file on another print to, to uh, positively match an animal. So this is a very exciting bit of my work and um, hopefully this is something that we can continue to use when there's uh, more ringtails around in the future that we may not want to actually physically capture. All right, so what's the problem? This is all science. This is great, fantastic, but they're still getting into the buildings. We need to actually address this at issue as it stands and not um, be able to do something about it moving forward. But I, I'd like to really um, convince you that understanding the science of these animals is very critical to solving the problem. Knowing their behavior, knowing their, their um, biology can really help you prevent issues before they begin. So, in the buildings, why are they there? Well, if there's, every animal looks for food, water, shelter, and mates. In the winter, you're obviously probably not going to find a mate in a building, but if there's shelter and it's warm, whereas it's cold outside, if they have an access point, they're going to use it. If there's food available out, they're, they're going to take it. So they are opportunistic, like I said. They're omnivorous. So any food that's, a, that's present, they will take advantage of it if they can. The pro another problem, other than just the irritation of it, is that the scat is present. And we don't know if this is a health hazard either for humans or for the ringtails. Chances are it's not. There's never been any uh, measure of, of a health hazard with ringtail scat and things like that. But we're just not positive, so it's not really safe, especially in places like the lodge where they're getting into um, food prep areas. And they're, it's obviously not something you want on your desk or uh, near your lunch or things like that. And of course, we're all familiar that it's, there's a pretty significant financial impact when law enforcement has to come and clear a building that has had a ringtail trigger, the security alarm, and things like that. So we just need to prevent this so that we are dealing with the problem before it begins. Also, building damage can occur that the, other than the scat damage, the ringtails are actually physically creating holes for themselves sometimes and they may not just be using holes that are present so at all times the exterior of a building must be monitored and maintained periodically maybe once a week maybe once every other week maybe once a month whatever um, has been decided upon to be a convenient and effective time lapse the exterior of the building needs to be walked and monitored to make sure new holes haven't come up. The ringtails will remove shingles, they will um, pull down wiring, things like that to actually create an access point for themselves. So to understand our animal, knowing this behavior, knowing the fact that they can climb walls extremely well, they can climb basically sheer concrete walls, knowing that they can dig, they can pull apart uh, roofing, like I said, or creating um, holes in the wire covers on vents and things like that is is very important to know um, in the buildings and, and understanding how they're getting in is critical. If there's no holes, they're not going to get in. An open door counts as a hole. If people are forgetting to close windows, and uh, the ringtails are going to use that. Um, what types of food are they eating? Like I've I've mentioned already, they're opportunistic. So it's it's not that you there's possibly just a frog inside that they're chasing. They're going to eat granola bars. They're going to eat uh, boiled eggs. They they love boiled eggs. So anything that you probably would eat, they will probably eat. Uh, they are a latrining species. So once they begin defecating in an area. They will sometimes choose that as a latrine, and it's unclear what determines where they'll use a latrine, but they'll continue returning to that same spot um, over and over again as a marking measure. So if you find that there is a, lat a ring to latrine within your building, you have to be doubly aware that they are probably going to continue to attempt to return there until you deter them. 
The entrance location and signs is always a bit surprising when I explain this to people, that their head, I'll get into this, but their head is only about two inches in diameter, maybe a little bit larger with a male, but any hole that they can get their head into, they can get their body into. So the, the animal itself might be two feet long, but you really have to think about the hole that its skull can fit in. And if its skull can fit in, it needs to be, that needs to be blocked. And the large males may have a two, two and a half inch diameter skull, but the juveniles may have smaller. So just keep in mind that the very, very small holes that you think might be negligible are in fact access points for these animals. And once they get into a hole, they can then traverse through the insides of walls, through air ducts, through uh, foundation, things like that. As soon as they gain access through the exterior wall, they can find a way to get wherever they need in the building. To give you a bit of a comparison of the potential animals, if you find an animal, you hear an animal, or know that you have an animal in a building, but aren't quite sure what it is, in this area, these five are probably the main five that you might be getting confused. Skunks are also an option. In this area, we have spotted and striped skunks, but um, those in general, you'll pretty much know if you have a skunk. Um, so. Their prints are very different. If you see their prints in the dust, in the dirt, um, in charcoal, whatever, uh, you can kind of tell them apart. All the animals except the ringtail have a, a toenail register. So you can see little dots or stripes where their toenails will actually hit the ground, where those ringtails don't have that. Their claws are retractable. Ring raccoons are much, much bigger. That one is should be very, very obvious. It looks like a handprint as opposed to a paw print. Um, squirrels are the easiest to confuse with a ringtail. But the way you can tell the difference is ringtails always have all five toes are leaving a print, whereas squirrels do not. They have four. On the back, they will have five showing, but the, the toes are much farther away and they're much smaller. Chipmunk and mouse are much smaller prints, but I put them on here as a comparison because they are the other culprits to make it maybe get into buildings. Now if you find scat, a ringtail scat is usually dark. This isn't necessarily true, but it's usually dark, will often have berry seeds, and it has this very folded nature. It gets these creases along the way, and it's usually in one segment um, like this. This one is actually broken. It was uh, one, but it's, it's rarely more than one. Raccoons are much larger. They are very, very large scats, and they are in four or five segments. They don't have the tapered end. That this this has a very narrow tapered end. The the raccoons don't have that. This looks more like a dog scat. Squirrels, chipmunks, and mice are all pellets. These are very, very small. These are going to be a little bit larger, but you can see with the scale here, they're still extremely small, or comparatively to a, a ringtail scat. I mentioned their skull size. Uh, these aren't exact uh, replicas in these this diagram I made on PowerPoint, but to give you a bit of a, a comparison between two, three, two, one and a half, one inch kind of skull sizes, the raccoon is probably going to be a little bit larger than three inches, and they are not as good as the ringtail at fitting their entire body into a hole that their skull can fit through, whereas the raccoon, or the, um, excuse me, the ringtail, squirrel, the rest, they are, excuse me, are able to do that. So keep that in mind. If you think you have an animal, you can use those signs to help you figure it out. And like I said, the biology helps. If you have multiple animals and you can hear lots and lots, chances are it's not a ringtail or a raccoon. They are not colonial species the way the others are. Ringtails will commonly be solitary over winter. They may den up with one individual or possibly two others, but that's rare. Uh, same with raccoons. They're usually alone. Both ringtails and raccoons are territorial, so once they have decided that they want to be in an area, they're going to defend it and they're going to fight for it. Not necessarily fight you in their aggression, that's not what I'm implying, but they are going to fight other animals. They're going to be very um, determined to stay in one place uh, initially. If the animal is awake during the day, it's probably not a ringtail. It's usually a squirrel or a chipmunk. And at night, you may have a mouse, but you should 
be able to tell the difference between a raccoon, a ringtail, and a mouse. Um, so keep that in mind. Over winter, uh, the only individual here that really hibernates is a squirrel, but ringtails will go into a, a, what is called torpor, and it's just a slowing of the behavior. It's they're they're not quite as active, but they they won't hibernate down. So you they they will still move around. They hunt. Um, they're awake through winter. So why does any of this matter? Um, there's a problem. Why can't we just deal with it and forget it? Well we're finding that there really aren't very many ringtails in this canyon. They're, they're present, it's a healthy population, it's a reproducing population, but there's just not as many as we thought. They're a much lower density species, more like if you compare um, the number of deer in an area, they are a higher dense species than the number of bobcat in an area. The, this lower density is usually a, a carnivore's trait, and it turns out the, these ringtails are, are looking like they're more on the side of solitary, large, larger areas being used, not very many in the area. So every single one of them is very, very important to this population. So if there's one getting into a building, we can't just dispatch it or get rid of it or forget about it. Every single one is very critical for this population. And like I mentioned before, out of everything I've used, I've only seen 20 individuals. I know that there's more out there, but there can't be that many more. Um, so there's just, there, each and every one of them is pretty important. So like I mentioned, this, this is classified in a term called low density. But it's also not just you. It's not just the building problems. It's not just the, the irritation and the financial cost. It's the problem for the ringtails as well. If we look here on the left, this, this top left picture, that's plastic. And this was collected in the, this is scat, this was collected in the lodge. And whatever this ringtail ate, it managed to pass it and process it. But plastic is really, really dangerous for them to be eating. It can cut the intestines, they can block the intestines, it can kill the animal. I have no idea what this purple pink fuchsia material is in this scat in the center here. It's, it could be a napkin or a towel or something. It's completely unnatural and not sure what it is. And then on the right, this is probably paper that the ringtail ate that as it digested it became this solid mass and this was much larger than most scats. So this, this really did impact this animal pretty significantly. So not only is this impacting what they're eating, it's how they're digesting it, how their bodies are digesting it. We, you know, here in Zion, we're always telling tourists about um, the impact on squirrels from feeding them. It's similar concept with the ringtails. We aren't consciously feeding them, but they are finding human food, but they're also finding human refuse that they're eating that could be um, changing the behavior as well as changing their safety and their survival. But this is also impacting them in the way of their human interaction. They may have a lower level of fear of humans, and not that they need to fear us, but there needs to. But for their safety and for human safety, there needs to be a barrier where they do not impact, interact, excuse me, with humans. And this is changing the more often they're near humans within buildings. So you might ask me, okay, we have a ringtail in a building. Why can't we just capture it, move it, let it go? Well, we tried this, but also you need to understand that when you think of what an animal needs, shelter, food, water, will it be able to find it at that new site? If you move it to this prime, beautiful ringtail habitat that has everything they need, there's probably somebody that's already there. This this chant, if if everything is perfect and it's ideal, there's a ringtail there already. So if you move a new ringtail in, they're going to fight. One of them is going to be driven out. They are solitary, so this is impacting both animals then. But if the ringtail was also at the site you captured initially, I'm going to go back to bullet point one here, then if it was there and you move it and it say it never comes back, another ringtail is going to come in and use that site because it, the initial ringtail was there for a reason. So every site that is potentially suitable for a ringtail probably already has a ringtail. So that's this really important that moving it, you can't just turn it into somebody else's problem and forget about it. 
the animal is probably going to try and come back. They are territorial, and that effort can kill them, especially in winter when their resources are low, their fat reserves are low. If you move it when it's cold, it's it's a low survival rate. And this, this animal is very, very critical in this area. There aren't many carnivores in this canyon. Uh, there are bobcat. There have been reports of mountain lions, everything, and uh, coyotes, and obviously foxes. But... But these fill a niche that's just a little bit smaller than a fox, but bigger than, you know, a mouse and a squirrel. So they are very, very critical. And national parks are conserving entities. And I, I know it is irritating when they get into buildings and cause problems. But, but they're there to conserve, and this is a resource of the national park. And so we need to take care of these animals in the best way for them. That's also the best way for us. So how do we balance this? The best way is really just through preparation, to deal with the problem before it becomes a problem, to prevent rather than um, respond to it as a result. So you might be telling me or say, thinking to yourself that, well, there's no problem right now. I haven't had a ringtail in my building in months. It was a problem last year. It's not a problem now. The thing that drives an animal's behavior is the limiting resource. If it has all the food it needs but it doesn't have shelter, it's going to change its behavior to find its shelter. We do it as well. Every animal does it. Whatever you need the most is what drives your behavior. That's your critical need. So as the, the temperatures drop, if that animal needs better shelter, it's going to seek it out. And if your building is the best shelter available, well, it's looking pretty good that that's what it's going to spend all its time and effort trying to uh, accomplish and, and obtain for itself is the shelter that's inside your building. And summer is not exclusion. This is something that was um, a bit of a an unexpected discovery that in the summer these ringtails just aren't here. They've moved off, they've gone into other canyons, there's more water present um, once the monsoon season arrives so they they can spread out a little bit more but as the temperature drops, as the water goes away, as you know the their prey species um, begin to go into hibernation or die off, as the berries disappear they they need more resources and if those are available in the building like I said that's what's going to be driving them so as winter is arriving is your building ready are you ready are you prepared for what what could be coming is are you do you have everything you need do you have um, the supplies ready to fix your building if you find a problem um, do you have expanding foam that you could fill a wall hole with or extra shingles or an extra chicken wire to to cover these access points so just be ready before the ringtails show up and you need to really be on the offensive that um, because they're going to take advantage of the situation if it's if it's there so things you can look for as you think a ringtail might be arriving is there scat on the trails on the sidewalks is it near the doorways they really like to defecate right next to a door and I don't know if they realize that it's a door if they know it's an access point if they can smell us coming and going but um, along windowsills and doorways they, they really like to use those we all know that mice move into buildings as the temperature drops and as winter comes and that's a prey species for these guys so as rodent presence goes up so does ringtail presence so if you have more mice in your building be aware they're extremely good mousers that's one reason they were called miners cats is that gold miners would actually domesticate them and keep them in camp to hunt mice for them so they they do love mice best sign is paw prints. Other than the scat is the paw prints that you're going to see in dust or in sand or if there's on countertops, sometimes they'll drag in a little bit of dust on their feet. You can see it on chairs, um, things like that. So if you do see those or on railings, they, they love to run along railings or walls. So those are good places to keep an eye out. All right, so I've given you a problem. I've given you some suggestions, but really, how do we fix this? This is a bit of a wrap-up just to drive these last couple points home. Prevention is key, not response. Response is good. Response is successful, but really, if you prevent it, it's it's the best best method. And I know that we've tried. I know that everybody is aware of this problem, and we are doing our best, but really keep in mind that there's no golden key. You aren't 
ever going to reach a point that you say, okay, the ringtail problem has been fixed. This is something that's constant. It's a maintenance issue. We have to maintain the buildings. We have to upkeep uh, the problem because it is a dynamic situation. The ringtails are changing. We're changing. Weather's changing. Buildings are changing. So it constantly needs to be on everybody's radar and um, something that we continually check week after week after week. And as my advisor, Nikki, mentioned, um, which I just thought was a very apropos quote, is uh, brushing your teeth is easier, cheaper, faster, and a lot less painful than a root canal. So if you take 20 minutes once a month and check your building, make sure that, that there's no holes, that there's no access points, that's a, a really significantly easier method than the hours and hours that it's going to take to trap them and move them and find the hole that they're in once they've come in and deal with the scat and deal with the cleanup and deal with the law enforcement and all of it. So if you can just prevent that from starting, that's really the best groundwork. But it has to be done routinely to be effective. It can't just be done once. So if you have a ringtail in the building, despite your best efforts, which I commend you are probably as as good as anybody could wish for. A ringtail still gets in. I don't blame you. There are they are smart, really, really conniving little guys. They um so they get in. Now what do we do? Don't 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 please don't trap them unless you are approved legally and trained to trap them. Handling is extremely dangerous and it's risky. And that's both to you as well as the animal. It can be extremely stressful for the animal, especially when it's done incorrectly. And like I said, this is we are a conserving entity. And the higher stress you place on an animal, the more dangerous it is, the more likely that animal is going to die or have problems. And it's dangerous for you. So please do not take it upon yourself to trap these guys. The park protocol for wildlife is that resource management must handle this. They are prepared. They know what they're doing. They know the best ways and most effective ways to trap and move these guys. So um, if there is a, a ringtail in building, resource management must be the ones to handle it. They're the only ones that are supposed to have traps. They are the only ones that are supposed to use traps. So please contact um, Fred or Cassie to to help you deal with a ringtail that's in a building. Just to give you an idea of kind of what it takes to be able to trap these guys, for me to be able to trap them, I have to have multiple, this is paperwork, it's called an Institutional Animal Care and Use Committee forms to be able to, to conduct research. I have these with Zion National Park, or excuse me, with the National Park Service. I have these with the university I'm at, and I also have certificates of registration with the state to be able to handle these animals and resource management has all of this this paperwork as well to be able to do this legally you're not allowed to trap without these so just keep that in mind when you're making decisions about um, what how to handle a situation you you really need to follow park protocol so moving forward with these guys, I'll throw up another picture. It's been a while since you've seen how cute they are. I remind you how adorable uh, this animal is despite its irritation. Um, I've harped on it enough at this point, but prevention is the only real way to move forward. And if they do get in, do not deal with it yourself. Please call a professional. If this is outside of the park, uh, call the fish and game, and, or if it's in the park, deal with resource management. So my final results on this project, all of these numbers that, it, that weren't ready for this, the analysis, they're going to be available in a few months. So if you really do want more information, this is going to all be given to resource management and they will have everything you need to learn about the, res the research I've done here for the last two years. So um, thanks very much for everybody's help and assistance over the last two years. So um, obviously Zantara National Park Service were... Um, critical for this, but also my university, Utah State, and I've also had some help with from a ringtail biologist named Dr. David Wyatt. He's in California, so thank you very much for your help and assistance. Good luck with your ringtails.